And we are live, or at least we're trying to be. It's moving very slow. This is JWC live stream. JWC live stream uh, story autopsy with Ricky and Tom. Sans Tom, because he's not here. We don't know where he is. But we do have our guest author, Amber Danson. Uh, so I'm, I'm Ricky. Hello, everyone. And, uh, Hey, Amber Danson. And there's Amber Danson, our guest author. And, um, it's the usual situation with JWC. Our writer's community is here for you, uh, to help you get through the, the trials and tribulations and the tumult of this life. This, the way things have been going lately is, it's just getting spookier and spookier. But in this particular case, we try to stay creative. Uh, I'm speaking for myself. I'm a creative obsessor. Um, that word obsession, it has this yucky context, but I'm trying to bring it back. I'm trying to rejuvenate it, uh, especially because I, it is like that. All I think about is writing. Like that's all I want to do all day is writing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm writing, it's never enough. Uh, you get satisfied, though, when you get a nice chapter, a good block of a thousand words, two thousand words. And I've been writing these little thousand snippet chapters lately. But um, there's just so much going on. I mean, um, I'm, I'm outlining this RPG book thing that I want to do. Uh, I'm, I'm working on this sci-fi novel, Chiram 6. Um, I, and, and we have this project. This is why you guys got to come. And I'm talking to the audience here because Am Amber shows up to these things. Um, on Tuesdays, we have a meeting, JWC Classic, uh, Tuesdays, 7 to 9 Eastern Time. Um, we get together and we talk creative shop, go over our creative obsessions, adaptive book craft, like, why well, write all these stories? What am I going to do with them? Um, well, we, we, we talk about that. We try to figure it out. So last time we were blundering around, going over ideas and somebody, I think it was Brenda. She said, um, oh yeah. What about these, uh, what about these choose your own adventure books? So me being a goose that I am, I said, well, we got to do one because that's just so cool. I haven't done one yet. So and, and I was just a tinkering with the outline um, like this is the good choice. This is the one that kills kills the story uh, back and forth in a nice in a nice tree. I, I made an Excel sheet and then I did an outline in docs. And uh, I'm just this Tuesday, we're going to unpack it. We still don't know what we're going to write about, but I'm, I'm super thrilled. And books coming out, everything's going great. Um, creativity is wonderful as always. How about you, Amber? Um, how's your creativity been? What are your top three projects that you've been, you've been slinging words at? <clears throat> well, I have a version of Red Riding Hood that I decided to work on. Yeah, <laughs> I have a version of Sleeping Beauty that uh, I've been do was uh, doing research on for most of yesterday. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, my uh, my idea for the Sleeping Beauty is that the prince fails to rescue the princess because he's either beguiled by the witch or just. <laughs> doesn't want to marry the princess and decides to elope with the witch. I haven't decided yet. Beguiled and, by freedom instead. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And uh, the princess gets rescued by one of her handmaidens instead. It's a lesbian love story. Mm, well, there's room for all sorts out there. And uh, your your fairy tales being what they are. Um, I, I mean, your voice in all things is, is unique and authentic, but the idea of you writing fairy tales sounds fantastic. Um, I tried my hand at my own modern one with that that uh, bug essence story, that fairy in a bottle thing. Mm -hmm. um, that because that feels like some kind of contemporary uh, fairy tale to me. Uh, has a lot of magic in that. I, I'd yeah. love to get back to that. But no, um, the, all those stories sound sound great. Like parallel 
fairy tales or alternate fairy tales is a wonderful thing for you to tackle. Um, so yeah, that sounds good. And you've been you've been writing regularly, throwing down words. Not so much throwing down words as I've I seem to have regressed to back when I was a teenager and I was just getting new ideas a lot. So I was. I'll write a little bit on one idea and then I'll get a new idea and write a little bit on that idea and get a new idea and write a little bit on that idea. Fantastic. Um, over here at JWC, we call that a muse flash when you get a new idea because there's a difference between inspiration and your own personal muse that gets gifted to you by your unconsciousness. It's like some people have dreams uh, like Tom with his Emily story, I think that emerged out of a dream. Uh, some people keep dream journals because inspiration comes out of the, the unconsciousness. Um, you know, like the, the, the difference between awake and, and sleeping versus awake and dreaming. There's that twilight of daydreams that uh, brings us into the, the creative mindset. And then a muse flash strikes, like just, just randomly. Or it could be because we're obsessing over a certain type of text. But either way, it's, it's our own original take. And then that's when, the, that's when the creative obsession hits and you have to write. You're at work or you're out on er doing errands or whatever. And you're just like, man, as soon as I get home, I got I to gotta hit that keyboard um, and, and get a decent amount down. And in your instance, you're taking you're, you're outlining synopsises for uh, like news flashes of a, of a whole story, like the synopsis for a whole story, or you're just getting like little ideas that you're putting together. It's uh, kind of like synopsises for whole stories. Beautiful. Uh, it's more of my subconscious seems to want to work on uh, fairy tales because of the I had an idea for a Cinderella story, and I was working on that for a, <clears throat> for a little while, and then got the idea for the Red Riding Hood, then the Sleeping Beauty. Um, I have a small list of others I was going to think about later. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about doing a Romeo and Juliet version of uh, The Little Mermaid. Ooh. So there's like some some politics under the waves down there, or yeah. Or, and instead of a human, she's uh, falls for a sea elf. Yeah, I, I that's that's groovy. Uh, I I hope you do that one soon. All your stuff is is tasty. So, well, that's that's awesome. It sounds like you got a lot of irons in the fire, uh, and uh, we're going back and forth with ideas and concepts. This is great. So yeah, um, getting moving on now to the next thing. I was going to ask you, do you have anything to read today? Because uh, your reads are always such a treat, you know? Yes, I do. And it's funny you should mention dreams because the first one I wanted to read was inspired by a dream. I've always been fascinated by ancient Egypt. And apparently my subconscious decided to do something weird with that at one point, And I dreamed I was a Pharaoh's concubine dressed in yak fur. Oh, so. cool. <laughs> nice, I don't nice. know why yak fur of all things. Especially wonder... in, in nah. the humid heat. Yeah. But well, you, maybe you were from, you, so you, you were related to the pharaoh and you were wearing yak fur? That's interesting. We got to look that up and see if that's not a coinky dink. I don't even know if there are yaks in Kemet back then. Maybe it yeah. was imported. Maybe it was imported. Maybe you, maybe you liked imports. I don't know. Um, I don't know. And I, just, it was, I just <laughs> knew in the dream that it was yak fur specifically. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, that's more Mongolian. That's how, well, that's the thing. That's far, far away, uh, but still cool. The idea that your dream is just like, oh yeah, yak fur, by the way, <laughs> and you and you got and you got a uh, you got a story out of it, huh? Mm -hmm. It gave me an idea for uh, political intrigue, uh, ancient <laughs> Egyptian political intrigue story where the pharaoh is sick and his uh, son and daughter are vying for the 
throne. Well, that sounds nifty. Uh, if you could read it, that would be great. Let's let's check it out. Well, I've only got three pages, and it does involve um, the. It does involve a slave girl too, so it um, starts with her perspective, not the pharaoh. Dig it, dig it, yeah. Because um, obviously there were slaves in ancient Egypt, so yeah. It's far, far from unlikely. All right, well, let's read these three pages and see where it goes. I mean, maybe we can catch a later draft. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's hear it. All right. False dawn grayed the skies over Egypt. Ibis called from the lush marshes spreading on either side of the Nile, and the whining of mosquitoes ebbed as the pesky insects began to settle to wait out the heat. The fertile river valley was waking for a new day, and the grain fields waited. Tiamini was a light sleeper. The change in the nighttime noises as dawn approached always woke her before the slave master came. She spent many minutes snuggled under her light blanket, enjoying the sleepy lassitude just before true wakefulness and her rare moments of relaxation. It was a luxury she was pleased to indulge in every morning before the demands of her slave master and the spring planting claimed her. When work ceased for the day, she would be aching too, and too tired to properly enjoy anything. Even now she was sore, but the pain was not so bad that she could not ignore it. After a while, she rose with a sigh. Her childhood friend in Caius was still sleeping, lying peacefully beside her. Nothing short of heavy shaking, full morning sun, or the whip of the slave master could awaken her. To spare in Caius the latter, Tiamene always woke her just before dawn so they would have time to tidy their living space and wash their faces before being called to the fields. Incaius opened her hazel green eyes when Tiamene gave her shoulders a vigorous shaking. She was Hebrew, slightly paler than her sun-bronzed friend, but accepted as an equal by the Egyptian girl because they were both slaves and had always been slaves. Incaius embraced Egyptian faith as she had been orphaned at an early age and raised among the Egyptian slaves' children, of whom Tiamene was one. The two girls made their beds in silence before rebraiding each other's hair. Tiamene's sleek black locks smoothed quickly into a braid down her back, but Incaius's thick curly locks always fought such constraint, and so caring for her hair took some patience. This onerous chore left them with just enough time to wash up before the red gold disk of Ra peeked over the horizon. Perhaps tomorrow we shall try binding your hair into two plates, Tiamene remarked as she donned her coarse kilt. Slaves commonly went bare-chested into the field so that the heat would be less punishing. As both girls were on the verge of physical maturity, they found this slightly trying when they were drew the attention of the male slaves. Perhaps our honored master will allow me to chop my hair short, Incaius retorted as she completed her morning ablutions. One can only hope. Tiamene twined her black braid around a small clean twig, creating a knot at the back of her head. Incaius did not respond. Tiamene glanced over at her friend and found her staring at her wash rag, her face dead right, dead white. What is it? Tiamene asked, concerned. My womanly courses have begun. Incaius held out the rag with its telltale spot of red. Tiamene pressed her fingers to her lips, her dark eyes wide. This meant that Incaius would be officially considered a woman, open to the sexual appetites of not only her fellow slaves, but her harsh overseer and her master. As a Hebrew, she was not accorded the same protection Tiamene would have when her own courses began. Though every female slave was fair game to the citizens of Egypt, Laws existed which would protect Tiamene from mistreatment, and as equal under the law to her fellow slaves, Tiamene would not be subject to the whims of the work-hardened men they worked among. She would be protected by the female field slaves, as Incaius would not. What am I going to do? Incaius whispered desperately. Her exquisite beauty ensured that she would be much in demand. Indeed, men had been eyeing her for more than a year, circling her like vultures, just waiting for her time to come so they could partake of her freshness. 
From the way the slave master had been leering at her of late, she guessed that he had been eagerly awaiting for her to reach puberty so that he might order her to his quarters. Tiameni thought fast. Wait, let me speak to Banifret. Perhaps she can help. Incaius nodded miserably and watched her friend hurry from the alcove they shared. Banifret was an older slave with a reputation for discretion and was a confidant to most of her fellows. Tiameni claimed that her own courses had begun, but that she wished to conceal that fact as long as possible. As Tiameni's beauty was rivaled only by Incaius's, Banifret understood why. The older woman passed her several long strips of linen from her own stores. Be mindful, the others may be able to smell the blood. Thank you. T um, Tiameni clutched the fabric gratefully. I'll see if I can get something to take care of the smell. Benefret smiled at her. Ather be with you, young woman. And you, Tiameni hurried away. Ather, one of the multitude of Egyptian gods, was the protector of women. Tiameni returned to the alcove she shared with Incaius, and just in time for Incaius to get one of the strips of cloth in place as a pad and hide the others before the slave master came for them. They followed along with the others, each taking their hunk of coarse bread and munching it down quickly before heading out to the fields at dawn. The smaller children ran about, picking up any stones or debris. Strong men and women pulled the plows. Younger slaves, boys and girls of about Tiamani's age, followed behind with sacks of seeds, sowing the rows created. The weaker slaves and other children hoed, di hoed dirt over the seeds and dribbled water to encourage them to grow. Occasionally, the fleeter children would run up and down the fields with water for the other slaves. The sun climbed higher as the slaves toiled. The slave master watched from a shaded wooden scaffolding set up for that purpose. A few guards under his direction patrolled the edges of the field with whips and lashed anyone who lagged, though they were kinder to the small children and would crack a whip in their direction as a warning before applying the lash. When the sun, with the sun beating down and the temperature climbing, no one wanted the added difficulty of sweat dripping into a raw lash wound, so only those new to the fields dared ease up in the pace of work when the muscles began to tire. Incaius was very glad she was working as a seed spreader. She was able to inveigle herself into a group of preteen girls, with Tia many working close beside her. Her bending and straining were minimal, thus decreasing the chances that she would inadvertently reveal her secret. Even the sun worked in her favor, coating her body with sweat which effectively masked the smell of blood. She began to hope that she could get away with her deception, for a few years at least. She had no idea what she would do then. When the sun approached its zenith, half the workers were permitted to stop for lunch. Once they had eaten, they immediately returned to work and the rest of the slaves ate. There weren't more than a hundred slaves working the fields of their wealthy master, and it generally took them a full day to plow and seed one field. If diligent work enabled them to finish the field early and their work passed the slave master's inspection, they were allowed the rest of the day to rest. Though occasionally harsh, their master was fair enough to reward hard work, and this ensured that few of his slaves ever tried to escape. A few days, a few days later, Incaius's life changed forever. Their old master died of a massive stroke. As he was without heir, his entire estate went up for auction, including all his slaves. Tiameni and Incaius were just breaking for lunch when the news reached them that their lives would soon be different. This is just terrible, Tiameni breathed, her eyes filling with tears. What will happen to us? We'll be separated. Incaius gave her friend a quick hug. Don't say that. It will happen. I just know it. Shh. No, look at it this way. Despite long hours under the sun, we are both still beautiful. We could easily find ourselves as house slaves, and that work is much easier. This doesn't have to be terrible. This could be the start of a better life for us. Tiameni took a deep breath and just managed to keep herself from crying. But what if we're separated? If we are, we'll find each other again. Even slaves have a little free time. Don't worry about it. Tiameni tried hard to take her friend's advice, but she continued to despair inside. Incaius was her only friend, and she didn't want to lose her. Pharaoh was dying. A canker had eaten its way deep into his vitals, despite the best efforts of the priests. 
Ra was calling him home. Pharaoh Pefterabastet was pleased despite the pain, for Ra had granted him time to prepare for his death. He could say goodbye to his family and settle a minor dispute between his surviving children so that his will would be uncontested after he died. Those disputing children were before him now, twins a little over 17 years old. Though of opposite sexes, they were very similar in appearance, both handsome with long shining black hair and bright black eyes. Kenny Kerihotep stood tall and proud, no sign of his unease showing on his face. Beside him stood his sister, Kerebnik Benaret, gowned and bejeweled as befitted the daughter of Pharaoh, and her agitation was plain upon her face. Keddy secretly hoped that his sister would be named heir. After all, she was elder by 15 minutes and she wanted to be Pharaoh. But it was no secret to either of them that Keddy was the favorite. Father, Benaret inclined her head respectfully. Thank you for seeing me. She did not mention that she had been called away from her own projects by guards, nor that the timing was inconvenient. My daughter and son, Pharaoh coughed. Long have I known that there is some dispute between the two of you as to who should succeed me. I have given the matter much thought and spent the night in prayer that Ra might guide my actions. Wise, Keddy remarked. Kedbneth Kenebenaret. For a moment, the girl's heart soared, thinking that she was being named heir, but in the next instant, her hopes came crashing down. Though the people respect you, though you are undeniably charismatic, I'm afraid that it is your brother, Kenti Kerihotep, who will succeed me. I know the people think him cold, but he is my only son. Just as Ra was succeeded by his son, Osiris, so I will be succeeded by my son. It is the only right way. Benaret, Benaret swallowed her hope, but not her dreams. I understand. Keddy sighed inwardly. He knew his sister would be trouble for his reign, for dashed hope did not mean thwarted ambition. It seemed to be quite a lot of trouble for something he didn't even want. I know you don't want to be Pharaoh, my son, Pef Jabaset said as if divining his thoughts, but it is your destiny. You will rule well, for you will not be puffed up by the power of godhood. Yes, my father. Keddie bowed respectfully. Keddy will need a wife, Benaret remarked. There was more than one way to power, after all, and she did love her brother. But Pharaoh was shaking his head. I have arranged for you to be wed to the high priest Rahotep. He is much in need of a wife, and I believe the two of you will be well suited. Benaret's heart froze. Rahotep, he was an old man, nearly 30. She dared not disobey her father, but she bitterly resented being sold away into such a loveless marriage without her consent. Still, she suppressed her resentment and managed a cordial reply. It is a good match, father. I knew you'd be pleased. He gave her a weak smile, unaware of his daughter's ill temper. Now that's not all I wrote, but that's all I typed. That sounds fantastic. Um, <clears throat> the voice is uh, mystical, crystal clear. There's drama. Um, we get a good back and forth between the slaves and the pharaonic court. You know, the pharaoh's on his way to transition into the western lands. Um, and there's that, that friction and that tension there uh, that makes you go, hmm, what is she going to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is she is she going to tolerate this and the people because if she can have the people howling her name in the streets uh, and, I'm gonna... yeah yeah so and and and, 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 and Mary Rahotep is Rahotep going to try to use her as a path to the throne no no yeah it's real it's real tasty I mean it has the promise of intrigue just down a, a misty misty street um, I think it sounds fantastic. I'd love to hear hear more of it. Um, I'll have to go through my notebooks and find the rest. It's not yeah. finished, but I easily have fifty pages handwritten. Wow! Well, I would definitely expedite that. I mean, that's that's a fantastic muse, and I'd love to hear what's going on there. Um, it compels you, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really great. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you for, for reading. May I ask you, um, that's the one that came out of the dream? Yes, it is. Now, it a real short dream. It was just me being hanging out with the Pharaoh while I was dressed in yak fur. And yeah. <laughs> then I woke up and I'm like, what the heck was that about? And But because I've been fascinated by ancient Egypt for a long time, I just dug into ancient Egypt and decided to write a story. Dig it. Yeah. Um, my first exposure, other than seeing... Uh, pyramids and stuff in in the classroom i always watch the classic 10 commandments movie with uh, charlton heston and yoel brenner um it was just when i especially like if i stayed home from school or whatever it was like a standard operating procedure to watch that movie um or, or something some other classic like treasure island but um i got all that like uh you know, the visuals and stuff, it, it thrusts me back into that uh, ancient cinema, a magnificent treatment of, um, of ancient Egypt. So that's a good sign as far as that's concerned, because it, jog, it jogged me right back, you know, because um, there's friction there. Uh, and it, it, what you have promised would be uh, something along those lines, I think. Um, really cool. Um, well, my studying into ancient Egypt showed a whole heck of a lot of political intrigue. They were always, you know, plotting and trying to get power and all kinds of everybody doing everybody else in and marrying their sisters. Yeah, no, they did a lot. They did a lot more sister marrying than Rome did, but there was about as much slaughter and controversy. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I've I've come to know. Um, yeah, I mean, Kitty would be afraid to marry his sister because he'd be afraid she'd stab him in his sleep. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> the thing. I mean, there's no, there's not going to be any Jamie and Cersei situation there because they don't like each other, and they well, can't. It's not that they don't like each other so much as he just doesn't trust her because he knows that she wants what he's destined to have. So she she might just just do. In other words, yeah. she likes power. She lo she loves power more than she loves her brother. Is what he's, we're trying he's not, to say. He's not sure which one she loves more. Well, that's that, that's I, the thing. He doesn't know. Is her love for him stronger than her love for power? That's what the story's going to answer. Well, yeah, that's a fantastic situation uh, for a reader to find themselves in. No wonder I could already, I don't even know if it's solidified, but I could already uh, feel the allure uh, of wanting to know more. And I got to ask you, are you going to, are you going to put yourself in the story? That is to say the dream you had where you were clad in yak fur in the court of Pharaoh, <laughs> are, are you going to put a character that's just wearing yak fur? And, nah, and seemed absurd to me it's absurd it's absurd i was just wondering how much you were gonna wiggle the dream in there um because it's just well, the, so cool the you know dream just sparked the whole i have to do something about ancient egypt because it's really cool i'm gonna mm. do another story set in ancient rome oh what 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 age yeah and uh how are you gonna do that do you have a muse for that already I haven't decided what age of Rome yet, but I was thinking possibly Emperor Constantine. And uh, it's, uh, again, that there was a huge thing of human trafficking in, in ancient Rome. And it's a story about a procurer, which is basically a harem master who sells women for pleasure, who um, sells this young virgin to a guy who's looking for a wife and the virgin eventually figures out that this guy's not a bad guy after all. He's just lonely. Oh, cool. So at first she's apprehensive and then later on, maybe it's, uh, maybe it goes a little bit better. Um, well, that's cool. Uh, I love this historic fiction or prehistoric fiction, depending yeah, on how you look at it with a, Egypt. It's it, it's a prehistoric romance. <laughs> They're both yeah. prehistoric romances. I don't generally do romance, though. So. Hey, you know, 
Um, Wherever it takes me. Yeah, right? Yeah, and you, you play with tension so well, and that's really what what romance is on the page is like expectation and, and different tension being, uh, being used um, because that gets, that gets the reader. It's a, it's an immersive, you know, it pulls them in and want, it may, makes them want to know more what comes next. Uh, great read on that with Egypt. And we're, mm-hmm. we're going to, we're going to look forward to more of that story. Um, did you have anything else to read today? I have this one about uh, witches, vampires, and all werewolves and all kinds of things, urban fantasy. It's called Suffer a Witch to Live, and it's basically, um, it's a disguised parable. Okay. It's, it's about not judging, basically, but it's about a demon hunting priest who ends up teamed up with a coven of vampire witches to take down an evil vampire lord yeah I re- the process is that not all of the supernatural creatures are evil and that he has been slaughtering some of the good ones along with the bad ones and now he's got to carry guilt yeah i remember this one from tuesday we're in for a real treat i could definitely hear you hear you do this again so why don't you lay that on us now um Oh yeah, this is great. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Let's 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 hear it. <laughs> All righty. Cool evening air danced through the trees, whispering among the branches. Birds exchanged sleepy songs, tribute to a dying day. Here and there, a squirrel darted through the leaves. The forest was at peace. A woman walked along one of many well-worn narrow trails. She stopped when she found interesting bits of greenery or edible mushrooms. Willow bark and monkshood, chanterelle and death cap, hickory nuts and ripe blackberries, Erin knew they all had their uses. Her long hair tumbled down her back in a golden waterfall, restrained from her face with a circlet of wildflowers. Bare feet, muddy from long wandering, made little noise against the forest floor. Her flowing skirt was kilted up to her knees, and her dark silk blouse was tied midriff style. She fairly glowed with good spirits. A rustle in the underbrush caught Erin's attention. She paused, shifting the large wicker basket to her left arm. The birds had fallen silent, but her bright blue eyes probed the area. She could make out nothing but the deepening gloom of the forest. She rubbed her free hand over the back of her neck. A feeling washed over her. She spun around and stared, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. Still, she couldn't shake the sensation that she was being watched. Hurrying now, eager for the safety of her cabin, she rushed along the path her own feet had made. She had bear spray, good for deterring most wildlife, yet some instinct screamed at her to get home where she would have the best chance of defending herself. What made her convinced she was being hunted? Erin bas- hefted the basket on her hip and stumbled the last few steps to her warded door. Sigils etched into the wood, the best magic she knew, would protect her from any four-footed predator and many two-legged ones as well. She never locked it when she was out, since she lived miles from anywhere. Throwing the door open, she dropped her carry basket beside the entrance. Breathing heavily, she slammed the door and latched it. Silence reigned outside, but for many moments she couldn't hear it over the pounding of her heart. Edging to the window, she moved the curtain with one finger until she could peek outside. Nothing there. I'm just being foolish. She shook her head, smiling ruefully. It was her imagination running wild, since she didn't like being alone in her condition. She picked up the basket and the few berries which had spilled out and set the whole thing on her kitchen counter. The fresh herbs would need attended to right away if they were to maintain their virtue. While she gathered string, cutting board, and knives, she sang her favorite folk songs. Andrew would be home soon enough. Then she could convince herself that she was just being paranoid, that there was nothing sinister in this forest where she had lived for the last four years. Andrew would scry for threats, find nothing, and laugh at her for spooking at shadows. A smile teased the corners of her mouth as she thought of it. Too bad she had never mastered scrying magic but her soon-to-be husband was a competent sorcerer. The door crashed inward with a bang. 
Aaron spun toward the sound, par paring knife clutched in one hand. What she was seeing was impossible. Nothing could get through the combination of warding spells and heavy duty physical locks. Yet there he stood, a tall black clad figure with weather beaten skin. His dark eyes made a quick sweep of the area before fastening on Aaron. She raised her right hand, words of invocation on her lips as she prepared to do battle with the intruder. But she barely managed three syllables before he flung his hand out and clenched it as though gripping something. Whatever magic he wielded, it was potent enough to choke her into silence. Her wide, panicked eyes fell on the high white collar over his black button-down shirt. Terror coursed through her when she recognized it as a priest's collar. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. His voice was flat and terrible, stripped of all emotion. Both Aaron and the floorboards trembled as he made his way across the open foyer into the kitchen. I know the meaning of the sigils on your door, Bride of Satan. She struggled against the restraining magic, desperate to explain. She was a white witch, nothing like those condemned by the Catholic Church. Healing magic and protection charms were her bread and butter. But his magic held her as though his hand was actually curled around her throat. Power surged, slamming her into the stove. Her vision began to go gray, her chest heaving as she fought for air. The priest chanted in Latin, rolling words rolling through her like soft thunder. Aaron found the strength to raise her paring knife when he came close, a mean blighted knife in one hand. She slashed with desperation, ripping through his sleeve and scoring a red line across the pale flesh revealed. Whoever he was, pain meant nothing to him. Not even a flicker in his depthless eyes to acknowledge the damage, locked onto hers with frightening intensity. He raised his knife, knocking her efforts at self-preservation aside. Silver flashed as he swung the blade in a quick, vicious arc. Shock shivered along her nerves before pain came, cascading along her nerves like the flow of blood down her throat. The paring knife clattered to the floor. All her strength was now focused on holding back the lethal flood. She sank to her knees, her hands wrapped around her wounded neck. He looked down at her, his face a lifeless mask, before he reached past her to the stove. Gas hissed. The burner clicked, then whooshed. The towel draped over the oven's handle went over the blue flame and quickly ignited. More words of Latin, but Aaron could hardly make them out. The priest made the sign of the cross over her, said, May God forgive you for your sins, and strode from the cabin. Had to get help. Her throat was pouring blood, but Aaron was a witch. The wound was not beyond her healing abilities if she could focus long enough. She struggled to her feet. One simple spell to stop the bleeding. She knocked over half the bottles in her cupboard, but managed to find the dittany. So hard to think. How much blood had she lost? The acrid scent of smoke caught her attention. With her open throat no longer oozing blood, she turned and tried to scream. Sparks from the burning dish towel had jumped to her curtains, to the wicker basket full of herbs, to the lacquered wooden floor. Little fires smoldered all over her kitchen. Fire could destroy a witch more surely than a knife. She rushed to get out of the cabin before the fire was well and truly caught. She reached the front doorway when she collided with someone else's magic, knocking herself to the ground. For a few moments, she lay staring at the ceiling beams and struggled to breathe. Rolling smoke grew closer. Had to get out. She rolled over and stared at the arcane symbol etched into the rough wood of her front porch. Magic stronger than hers warded the door, keeping her trapped inside. One of the windows then. Surely he hadn't had time to ward all the windows. Erin pushed herself to her feet and staggered to the nearest window, threw back the curtains and stared at the spray paint on the pane, marking this window against her escape. With fear thickening her heartbeat, she checked every window. Somehow he had managed to mark all of them. Coughing, she dropped to all fours to get her head below the smoke. After taking a few careful breaths closer to the floor, she shoved herself upright, Methodical in her desperation, she wet a dish rag and held it over her nose and mouth. Then, breathing somewhat easier, she climbed the stairs to the loft. She had to live. More than her own life was at stake. There was no way he would have been able to mark the loft windows. With her throat raw from the double assault of knife and smoke, she managed to reach one of only two windows in the peak of the cabin's roof. 
The glass was blessedly clear. Sobbing with relief, Erin threw open the window and stuck her head outside. She took several deep gasps of the clean air, bracing herself for what she knew she must do. Then she launched herself through the hole into empty space, praying to the mother goddess that the impact with the ground wouldn't hurt too much. She tried to tuck and roll, but she was too weak to have any control. She tumbled over and over, feeling her bones snap in several places. Breathing became a torment. Her entire body ached so much she couldn't tell how badly she was injured. Dizzy and nauseous, she stared at the sky and struggled to understand what was happening. Basic healing magic. All she needed to do was focus her thoughts and speak the right words. The cabin was a loss, but she had started over before. Andrew would be home soon and everything would be... A dark shape blotted out her view of the tree-edged blue. Aaron let out a breathless shriek, recognizing the priest from the cabin. He gave her a look of pure disgust before he reached down and seized her wrist. Aaron tried to scream, but her torn throat would only allow her to whimper. Tried to kick, but blinding pain from her left leg made her wretch bile all over herself. I got it, boss. A youth came running from behind the cabin, tucking a can of spray paint clutched in one hand into the satchel dangling from his shoulder. When his hands were free, he grabbed Aaron's ankles. Between himself and the priest, they hoisted Aaron and carried her around to the front of the cabin. Please, she whimpered, shivering in their grasp. Don't kill me, please. Hold her, the priest commanded, releasing his grip on her wrists. The youth dropped Aaron's legs. She let out a thin, strangled howl and hauled her halfway upright, his, his arms under hers. The priest took out his knife again and made a leisurely cut. Against her better judgment, she threw back her head to scream for Andrew, but could only gurgle as blood poured from her re-severed throat. With a crisp, satisfied nod, the priest wiped his bloody blade on her shoulder and sheathed it before grabbing her ankles. Together now, he nodded to the youth assisting him, then jerked his head toward the busted-down door of the flaming cabin. No! Aaron tried to cry out in despair, but her severed throat betrayed her. The youth holding Aaron stumbled toward the door in tandem with the priest. Then they heaved her body through the doorway into the flaming interior. A little healing crack to keep herself alive. Dreadfully weak, she sealed the vessels in her throat and tried to sit up. The fire would consume her unless she could find the strength to create a shield. She was no expert at creating a personal shield, but it was her only option. Even then, it wouldn't save her if these men stayed to watch the cabin burn and found her alive in the remains. Don't think about that. After a moment's deliberation, she decided to draw the necessary sigils in her own blood, on her own skin. So hard to see in the smoky haze, so hard to breathe. Had she drawn them right? Her watering eyes would not tell her. No strength left. She flopped backward, chest straining. Only time would tell her if what little magic she could manage would be enough to save her life. James stood staring at the burning structure for many minutes while Floyd fidgeted beside him. He waited, but the witch did not emerge again. Relief made him feel weak, but he strapped a bit of mental steel to his spine and did not allow his shoulders to sag. I think we did it, Floyd said at last when the silence had stretched beyond his endurance. James nodded and turned away from the fire. The witch had made many paths through the trees, but he remembered which one would take him to his car. Ignoring the stab of guilt, he strode along the path with Floyd bobbing along behind him in a wave of nervous chatter. I didn't think it was real. Witches, you know. But then I saw that woman with her throat cut open and she wasn't even bleeding. She jumped out that window like she could fly. James nodded when Floyd paused for breath, though he wasn't really paying attention. Evil creatures exist. Damn, man, that's something. And those, those warding signs you had me put up, they really worked. I thought for sure, but she didn't try to get out of the downstairs windows. She went for the upstairs ones. We'll ward the whole house next time. James gritted his teeth, knowing he could allow none of the vile creatures to escape the Lord's justice. He was a man on a mission. Twelve years ago, he had been nothing more than a quiet village priest, fresh out of seminary school. He wanted nothing more than to care for his congregation and his aging mother. But that hopeful youth was gone now, 
and he the Vatican's most successful demon hunter, all because of one fateful night. James shook his head to clear away the cobwebs of memory, somewhat aware that his apprentice Floyd had continued his verbal diarrhea, but having no idea what the altar boy turned demon hunter had actually said. No matter, most of Floyd's chatter was meaningless energy. If he said anything important and James missed it, Floyd would repeat himself. They reached the car at last and climbed inside. James started the engine and Floyd chose a radio station with music to match his restless spirit. James tuned out Floyd's enthusiastic enjoyment of classic rock. Over the past five years, James had trained three would-be demon hunters, all with the full sanction of the Vatican. Two were now dead because they weren't fast enough or plane didn't listen. The third had thought better of demon hunting after a few months and a near-death experience. Bishop Carlyle had assigned Floyd to James a few days ago. This had been their first hunt together. Despite his lack of interest, James knew every detail of how Floyd came to be an apprentice demon hunter because Floyd rarely stopped talking unless the situation was serious. Unlike most of those in James's line of work, Floyd hadn't suffered a loss at the hands of the supernatural. He was one of those rare creatures to survive an attack by a supernatural being. Wrong place at the wrong time, and he had seen his life flash before his eyes when a werewolf in full lunar fury came charging at him out of the darkness. Fortunately for Floyd, a demon hunter had been on that particular werewolf's trail and killed the creature before it could cause any damage. Floyd had almost convinced himself that it was nothing more than an unusually large wolf when they ran across the witch. James smiled grimly as he listened to Floyd's motor mouth. The young man listened without question, which meant he was likely to survive long enough to learn what he needed to learn. If he needed to burn off his emotions by talking, it made little difference to James. Little enchantments, sanctioned by the church as godly magic designed to combat evil, kept James and his colleagues as safe as possible in their line of work. James was frustrated by how little he knew, how little was permitted to be part of his arsenal when evil would stoop to any low. He needed more answers in order to fight, rid the earth of these vile creatures, and besides the Vatican, there was only one source available to him. He would have to capture one alive and somehow persuade it to talk. When they pulled up outside the safe house, a trailer situated on the outskirts of an insignificant town, James cut the engine but turned to stare at Floyd instead of climbing from the car. What, do I have something in my teeth? Floyd pulled down the visor to check his teeth in the mirror. One of James's, one side of James's mouth went up in reluctant amusement. No, I need your help with something. Sure, boss, anything you want. It must go no further than the two of us. I must have your word of honor. Floyd nodded, nodded dark eyes wide and earnest. Staring into those eyes, James hesitated. Floyd reminded him of a puppy. Big feet, gawky limbs, and fearless energy. Hopefully, this idea, and Floyd's youthful curiosity, wouldn't get the young man killed. I want to start capturing instead of killing. James glowered at nothing. The thought was distasteful on the lips. We need to learn more about them if we are to fight them. I've searched the archives of the Vatican and can find precious little about our adversaries. I want to start studying them before we destroy them. Mischief sparkled in Floyd's eyes. You got it, boss. Anything you need. But, uh, you sure it's safe? I mean, can we really hold these things and keep them from escaping and killing both of us? I know enough wards and sigils to hold anything up to and including a minor demon. I would love to learn greater sigils, and that's where the supernatural comes in. James climbed out of the car, waited until Floyd also emerged, then locked the vehicle with the key fob before striding toward the trailer. Floyd trotted along beside him. You've got a line on something. James shook his head, sorting through his keys until he found the one for the trailer. Unlocking the door, he flung it open and kept his back to the wall as he swept his eyes over the open floor plan. A quick check of every closet, nook, and bedroom before he allowed himself to relax. He never took the safety of one of his safe houses for granted. His last apprentice made that mistake. James still carried the memory of sick, helpless rage when he found what was left after the the vampire who had been lying in wait was through carving his displeasure into the youth's flesh. He'd arrived before the creature finished feeding. 
enough time to destroy it, then the body in order to prevent it from rising as another vampire. All good? Floyd's voice came from the doorway, broke, breaking through James's black thoughts. Everything is fine. James unstrapped the large knife from his belt and eased into one of the living room chairs. Switching on the lamp, he unsheathed the blade and began to inspect it inch by inch. Floyd fidgeted nervously, putting things away, picking things up, and moving them for no discernible reason, cleaning the already clean trailer. He kept shooting glances in James's direction. James sharpened his blades and ignored his apprentice until Floyd was finally willing to seat himself nearby. How many of those demonic creatures are out there? Floyd asked with, with a poor attempt at looking casual. James shrugged. Could be hundreds or even thousands. There's no way of knowing, considering most people don't believe in them anymore. Floyd whistled. But I mean, it can't be that easy for them to hide. You'd be surprised what the closed mind misses. Hey, boss? James gave him a tolerant glance. What if there's something big we're missing? Disconcerted, James dropped his gaze and returned his attention to sharpening his blades. And that's chapter one. Man, oh man. Fantastic stuff as usual. But just how we're doing this with the uh, universal imagery. She's walking through the woods, you know, and, and um, she, everything's cool. And then the door... The door bashes in, and then it's all madness, uh, psychotic madness. And he, in his mind, the priest's mind, he's he's doing the the will of God, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how you handled the the uh, the demon hunter trope, which is like a big deal for me when it shows up in fiction. The idea of a militant priest. Or, uh, you know, an exorcist. But in this particular case, we're dealing with the, the esoteric and the paranormal. So it's like, you know, the average Catholic wouldn't, wouldn't encounter this type of, of agent of the church. Um, and his, his, uh, his familiarity with magic, how he's using magic which puts him on, on the deep, on the fringy es esoteric, because that mm -hmm. sort of thing, don't get me wrong. If you parcel through Catholic history, you'll find, you'll find things like that. Uh, priests known to uh, practice in certain petty, petty spells or, or certain witchcrafts, but yeah. Officially sanctioned magic. Yeah. Or officially denied when it's, when it's confronted, depending on uh, how obvious it all turns out to be but just really really tasty stuff all the way through it especially i mean toward the beginning is a great setup but towards the end i'm just like wow i i want to follow these two and see what terrible things i mean they they're atrocious their zeal has made them uh their own kind of monster because i'm assuming there are a few black witches like witch practicing terrible blood magic or whatever that they're dealing with but they this guy just he throws a blanket over the whole thing like that white witch wasn't doing anything and he's just yeah. like no nope. yeah <laughs> heavy aaron duty was, aaron was minding her own business selling healing potions and love love charms yeah yeah which again they don't they don't like that stuff but that the, i don't know if if they bring the hammer down on everybody i guess I guess it depends on what year we're talking about um, when the story takes place. Well, this but, is modern day since it's urban fantasy. And I see. He, James is just dogmatic. He encountered one evil creature, one evil supernatural creature, and the church told him, oh, all evil, all supernatural creatures are evil. And being a child of the church, he was like, oh, OK, they're all evil then. So I'll just go kill them. Right. Yeah, well, I could see him coming to that conclusion. I wonder what it is these days with the Catholic Church, because the Pope has said that if an alien were to show up in the Vatican, as in an extraterrestrial from another planet, that he would he would make every attempt to baptize him and, and make him a Catholic when he arrived. <laughs> so now there's certain there's certain branches of occult philosophy or paranormal phenomenology, you know, the way they view it is 
well, the UFOs and the occult are, are linked and there's a commonality between the two of them. So it makes me wonder, like, if a vampire showed up, like, what, what would they what would they do to that? You know, yeah. um, I mean, I know they've softened their stance on, on paganism you know tremendously over the centuries for one thing they don't burn them anymore uh so this mm -hmm. guy this priest is particularly zealous and and flies uh, against the wind of the general trend of uh, of catholicism but it's like he could be like a john constantine or whatever like he he you know i mean certainly not in his disposition uh, mm -hmm. but uh but you know in his in his quest uh very similar. That's a fantastic read, uh, Amber. Um, really, really amazing stuff. And that kind of concept, you know, I could, I could really, uh, I could really hear a lot of that. I'm hoping you're, you're planning to write more of that, right? Yeah, it's going to be a full size novel. That's yeah. We could definitely deal with that. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, folks. Uh, you know, time, time flies when you're, when you're having fun, when you're being creative. Um, and it's, it's just about that time now. Um, it's been a great show. Fantastic reads. Uh, we're going to push the topic uh, into next week, I think, but for the time being, let's do plugs before we split because we are creatives. You just heard her read. Amber read some good stuff. She writes. She's got a book. She got some books for sale and more and more by the month. Um, so, Amber, what are you plugging today? Well, I wanted to mention that the sequel to Death's Nightmare, which is Death's Gamble, is available for pre-order now. It's up for release October 1st. Anybody who wants a copy can reserve theirs now. You hear that? So that's Amber Danson. Go to Amazon and get yourself a copy and and reserve yourself, pre-order the other one, which will be out soon. And then you got your Shattered Sky. I mean, I, it's I, this is um, that's I know that's down the pike, but um, yeah. um, fa it's fantastic to hear about it. I have um, I'm selling today. I'm selling Babeltron, uh, Babeltron after the fire. It's something I wrote for JWC. You can find it on Amazon. My name is Richard Andrew Olkus. That's the author named Babeltron after the fire. I also have through my other source, Oakwood Publishing, and, and available on Amazon, I have Book of Masroth, Volume 1, um, which is called Masroth's Emergence. And coming out on the 13th, which is only a few days away, I have... Book of Masroth, Volume 2, which is called Masroth's Descent. So just head over to our Amazon pages and, and throw us some mercy clicks. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're creatives. We're, we're doing our best to enrich the world of imagination and to network minds and, and do all these wonderful things. And who doesn't need a little vacation into a fancy uh, especially with the world as roughly and, and uh, you know, d uh, crazy as it's been lately. Um, so bear that in mind. Check us out, Amazon.com. Uh, Head over to joeswritersclub.com and check out our, our author stuff there uh, and our blogs. And also sign up at joeswriters.club which is our forums. We have a wonderful internet community, a writer's community, and we have meetings on Tuesday, uh, seven to nine Eastern time. We talk creative shop. Um, we'd love to meet you. Come on out. If you're writing a book, we're, we have a lot of fun projects going on. I want to thank Amber Danson for, um, for her reads and uh, for, for joining us today. And I want to thank our audience for listening. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Please head over to jo jo Joe's Writers Club's YouTube page. Like and subscribe. Uh, we're trying to boost our numbers over there. And thanks for listening. Uh, you guys take care. Stay creative, all right? Make sure you do some writing or read something nice. See you later. Bye, everyone. <laughs>